This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. In 1968, research transformed our understanding of how share prices react an announcement by a company. Reflecting the importance of that research, Professor Ray Ball has been granted an honorary doctorate by the University of New South Wales. Now, Ray is with me this afternoon. Ray, can you just outline your research for me? Yes. Um, prior to, to our work, uh, people really didn't look much at share markets. They didn't look at them in terms of flows of information at the share prices. The accounting profession really didn't have much idea of the impact of the, their product, which is you know, income statements, balance sheets reported to the public. The accounting profession didn't know much about the uses in which they were put, the effect of them on share prices, anything of this sort. Uh, and it was rather fun to be involved in the first study to, to uh, look at uh, the relationship between earnings announcements and share price behavior. So were you aware of what a watershed it was, the fact that there hadn't been this sort of analytical research beforehand? Yes, we, we were aware that something was going on. The, um, we had the advantage that the people coming before us uh, had some rather extreme views that, that uh, the information put out by accountants was worthless. And so we had a, a sort of, we, we knew what black looked like and were able to show there was some white, if you could use that as a metaphor. Uh, and that made our results quite a contrast to what many people had believed before. So that was an advantage we had. Um, and it, uh, it sounds odd to say that, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, if people have had the opposite view to you before you form a result, uh, it's an advantage. Uh, and uh, certainly in your research, you're looking about the changes that uh, can happen with a company just before it's likely to make a big announcement. But suppose that announcement's a surprise. Suppose nobody uh, anticipates it. How, what, what does your research say about that? Uh, earnings surprises are, are closely followed uh, in the financial markets. Uh, and earnings surprises where the outcome is different than expected. And yes, uh, then and now, uh, earnings surprises do move pr uh, share prices at the time at which they occur. Um, what our research showed was most of the information in earnings was anticipated by the share market well before the announcement. Uh, but uh, when the announcement occurred, yes, there definitely is a surprise and prices move. But is it also possible it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy? People know that a company is likely to be making an announcement, they know when it's going to be happening, and so they may anticipate this, therefore the share price may rise anyway, and so it rises because people expect it to rise. Well, it's not a, I wouldn't call it a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's certainly true that if people expect good news from a company, the price will rise before the announcement. Uh, people don't wait around for the announcement if they have <laughs> reason to believe that, that the news will be good. Uh, they act at that time, they form that belief and the prices move then. Conversely, if people believe the news is going to be bad, uh, the prices move downwards in advance. So that's why this notion of a surprise is very important. It's what the outcome that's announced was relative to what people expected. And that, that's not a self-fulfilling prophecy, except in the following sense. If the expectations were wrong, the price has to be revised when the actual turns out to be different than expected. Uh, and we're now in a rather different information era. After all, in 1968, we didn't have the internet. Now people can get share prices in real time. They can list all the company's previous announcements. Information travels so much faster. So how is your research from 1968 relevant to the stock market now? Well, well two things. Uh, one is um, Gene Farmer, a famous professor of finance at Chicago, uh, uh, back in the 1960s, uh, made the observation that inside information spreads at the speed of light. <laughs> and what he meant by the speed of light then was the telephone and not the internet. Um, yes, the internet certainly made a lot more information more accessible more immediately. Uh, but the other second point I'd like to make is that companies have become much more complex than they used to be. They're bigger. Uh, when we did our research, the average company was less than a tenth of the size of an average company now. Uh, the less complicated, there was less globalization, there was less need for information. Uh, we now live in a world where there is more information. And the two, the evidences tend to balance. Uh, 
the amount of earnings surprise has not changed a lot over time, even though we now have more information in advance. Why? Because we need more information in advance. And there are certain investors who obviously have a lot more information. I'm talking about people like Warren Buffett, who must have floods of information coming into them. How are they different from, say, the sort of mum and dad investor that's looking at where to put their super fund? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, uh, first, the average mum and dad really should put their money with Warren Buffett. <laughs> <laughs> if, if only we all could, yes. Yeah, if we were could. But no, uh, less facetious answer. Um, yeah, this is a big issue at the moment. The hedge funds you, uh, in recent times have shown that they've been trading on inside information by getting access to information before other people. Uh, that's normally viewed as creating an unfair capital market uh, and adversely affecting the prices of company shares. Uh, so we have rules, laws to try and, and minimize that. Um, but uh, let me go back and say there are people like Warren Buffett who not only get access to more information, but they have much better judgment. And one of the problems in practice is separating out the two, one versus the other. Um, but uh, certainly getting access to information before ordinary people uh, creates an unfair advantage in the capital markets. And equally, people uh, who, who have got a, a large amount of cash to invest or the hedge funds, they can put a lot of cash in a certain area. People can see uh, where, where a lot of money has been flowing. They can see where the volumes have been increasing in share trading. So again, suddenly at that point, people may think, well, all right, then let's put, put our money where, where they're putting it. To, to, to what extent does groupthink come into play? Well, groupthink is, is fine provided the, the, uh, the people who start, you mentioned the possibility of the hedge fund having information and moving trading volume and prices. Provided they actually are acting on good information, that's fine. Uh, so uh, if I'm a mum and dad operating in a capital market and people are trading good information into prices, that makes the prices better prices for me. The more information that's traded into share price, the less risk there is that the price is wrong. Okay? Uh, so the problem that, you, that has been uh, on the, in the public debate in recent times is whether or not people with large checkbooks can influence the price in a way that's not correct, uh, just put price pressure. Uh, the SEC actually ran a study on insider trading uh, back oh, now maybe a decade ago, and it was a very large, very extensive study, and their conclusion was on balance, uh, the first of the arguments prevails over the second. That is, that people with big checkbooks trading on information actually do make the prices better for you and me, uh, for mums and dads. Uh, now, of course, there are exceptions to every rule, and some of those people go to jail. <laughs> but uh, on balance, the trading of the large checkbook people tends to make prices better, not worse. Uh, although, of course, there is, as you say, that danger in, in almost following the herd and, and following the psychology. So I'm almost wondering that there's been quite a lot of research that has followed on from your original piece of research in 1968 that's uh, really looked at behavioral finance. It's questioning whether behavioral finance is actually the answer, looking at the psychology behind people, why people are buying certain shares. Definitely. Uh, and what behavioral finance has done uh, is... Uh, shown a very large body of very systematic evidence of uh, this consistent with the notion that the actions of you know, investor psychology do affect prices. Um, uh, the two responses to that, one is it's not a surprise to say that people are people and people act in ways that are consistent with them being people, not machines. <laughs> and so in that sense, behavioral finance is totally unsurprising. Uh, the second comment to make about behavioral finance is that it's uh, something that gives sometimes results that other people can build on and find more rational explanations for the, the, the behavior that's observed. And so I, I think it's been one of the most remarkable contributions to behavioral finance has been one of the most remarkable contributions to our knowledge of share markets in recent times, just as behavioral economics has in economics in general provided this with a lot of insights. But where the dust will settle on, on exactly what those insights are is still a bit up for grabs in academia as, as normal.
And in recent times as well, we've also had the global financial crisis. So how do you think that the sharp falls we've seen in share prices, and which of course have re recovered uh, recently, uh, again, how much uh, recent research has there been in that? It hasn't been research per se, but um, the, I think research has been done over the decades gives us some insights into it. Uh, first of all, going back to the notion that people are people. Uh, when people get scared, uh, there's a, they perceive the world to be risky, uh, and there's a flight to quality, and they prefer to put their money into safe havens, such as government bonds, and uh, they prefer other things equal to hold fewer shares. Uh, if a lot of people try to sell shares, the only thing that can happen, because someone has to buy them from them, is for the price to fall. Uh, so there have been many episodes like this through history where there is what's sometimes called a panic, where people become scared, uh, share prices drop. Uh, now, conditional upon the economy surviving, share prices recover. I should point out that in Japan, where the Nikkei was at 36,000 uh, and rapidly fell to nine, it's not much above that now, 15, 20 years later. Uh, I would have thought that the panics that are in Greece and Portugal will not be easily met by a sustained recovery uh, uh, subsequently. So sometimes panics have reasons behind them. Uh, not every panic is recovered from. So that, that's one thing we know from the historical evidence. Uh, in terms of uh, what happened in the United States in the financial markets, one of the things we learned is that liquidity is a very important uh, variable. And in all of the theories that, that we've been teaching our students, we've really underestimated the role of liquidity, in my view. Uh, and so that is going to be one of the things that will come out of this. I think there'll be a lot more research on, on the role of liquidity. Uh, the Capital markets, I believe, have been blamed a lot for the global financial crisis. In fact, I don't see it as a financial crisis. I think that word is a misnomer. Uh, it's a global crisis. Uh, I look at it in terms of the real asset markets. Uh, in the United States and many parts of the world, we created an excess supply of housing, more than people really want in equilibrium. Uh, and the government policy like low interest rates that encouraged that. So if you look at it in real terms, it's a global asset market. Uh, crisis. The financial markets, because they are efficient and move their prices quickly, were the canary in the coal mine. Uh, so when people uh, suddenly decided they didn't want to renovate any more kitchens, they didn't want to renovate, they didn't, you know, five bedrooms were enough, two holiday houses were enough, uh, and they, they put up the shutters in terms of, of the demand for new real assets, uh, the, uh, the canary was the, uh, was the share market. Uh, that's the easiest thing for you to sell, is a share. You can sell it today and get cash for it in three days' time. Selling property in real estate takes quite a while. Uh, so uh, the first signs occurred with the investment banks, the banks, the share market, uh, but I believe the ultimate crisis was an asset crisis. We created an excess stock of assets. And finally, Professor Raymond Ball, you're back on campus at the University of New South Wales. You've been granted an honorary doctorate, but you must have seen dramatic changes here over the past 40 years or so. What, what really do you notice now you're back here? Well, what I notice at the university is uh, how much larger and more sophisticated it, it, it is. Uh, we, um, when I studied, um, we studied in a tiny university. My graduating class was small. It was so small we had to combine it with other faculties to put on a decent show. Uh, we took many of our classes in uh, what were the demountable huts that were built by the army during World War II. Uh, now it's a beautiful campus. Uh, it's expanded a lot. Uh, many, many more students, much larger faculty, much wider range of programs, much higher quality instruction. Uh, it's just quite astounding to see the changes. Uh, a lot of that mirrors what's happened to Sydney and to Australia over that time period. Um, another issue is the cultural diversity has just remarkably different than it was when I was a student. Uh, and uh, all in all, uh, it looks good. Sounds good to me. Professor Raymond Ball, thank you very much. Thank you. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.